So it's six o'clock now, so we'll go ahead and get started um, with tonight's presentation. So this is our free monthly food and mood workshop. And today I'm joined with Dr. Nishi Bhopal. And tonight's topic is nutrition and anxiety. So we'll be talking about how the way we eat can impact our anxiety levels and also our mental health. A little bit about our practice and the types of services we offer and what makes us very unique. So at Pacific Integrative Psychiatry, we take a whole body approach to mental health. We don't just look at the way you feel emotionally and mentally, but we look at how is your body affecting your mental health and the way you feel and your mood. So we offer psychiatry, which involves medication management and integrative forms of treatment. Um, you have the opportunity to work with either Dr. Nishi Bhopal or our nurse practitioner, Josh uh, Habinski, who's also really great. Um, we also offer psychotherapy, coaching, and mindset work, and we have a therapist. His name is Andrew, and he's also accepting new clients. And then I offer one-on-one -on -one nutrition consultation. Um, so we do really individualized approach to how your nutrition can impact your mental health. And we offer specific laboratory testing that can look at your stool analysis, your gut microbiome, vitamin and mineral deficiencies to see how this is all really impacting your mental health. Um, Gazal wrote in the chat, my favorite snacks are chickpea puffs and dried mangoes. Yeah, those are really yummy too. All right. So a little bit of information about what you can expect for tonight's workshop and these monthly workshops that we have. So they're typically on the third or fourth Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m., uh, we record the workshops over Zoom, so you'll receive a complete recording of the workshop a couple days later. Even if you're not able to attend live, we still recommend signing up every time because you'll get the complete recording and everything you miss, so you can rewatch it. We highly recommend participating if you feel comfortable. You can write your questions in the chat or your comments as we go along, um, or you can turn on your camera and or your audio at the end, you can, and you can ask your questions that way. Um, we send you workshop through your email after you sign up. This is a great way to take notes, um, write down your questions or reminders to yourself as we go along. And then lastly, please respect everyone's privacy on here. If people share something personal as we go along and try to minimize distractions if possible. All right. And then before we get started with tonight's topic, I just want to um, go over last month and the monthly experiment that we do each month, something new that you can try. So last month we talked about nutrition and ADHD. Um, and we talked about how the way you eat can actually affect symptoms associated with ADHD, um, specifically uh, types of foods that are high in refined sugars, starches, carbohydrates. So I'm curious who was here last time. And if you tried an experiment or if you tried to eat different um, how did that go and what did you try? So let us know in the chat. And I'll, I'll share my answer too while we're waiting. So I tried to have a little bit less coffee and I was paying attention to how this was affecting my mood, my energy levels. Um, and I noticed that when I was having coffee more consistently, I really felt the tiredness, the low energy on the days that I skipped the caffeine. So my body had gotten used to it. Um, and I tried to cut back on it a little bit, having half a cup instead of a full cup. Um, and that was interesting. And I really noticed how it was affecting my mental health. Uh, Gazal said, I tried to have less potato chips as a snack and tried to eat more consistent meals. Yeah, the potato chips, we talked about how carbohydrates can impact our mental health, um, our ability to focus at times, and then also skipping meals. We'll talk a little bit more about that today and how that can really Im impact your mental health. Um, I tried to eat more protein, um, didn't get hungry as quickly later on. Yeah. And the protein is something that can really help with our satiety, our blood sugar regulation. And we'll talk more about that today and how it can help with um, regulating your blood sugars and actually reducing some symptoms associated with things like anxiety. And then Kirtana said, I tried to set a meditation routine and increase my protein consumption. 
it really helped with, with my anxiety and focus. Yeah. Really slowing down and, um, you know, increasing your protein at the same time. So you're putting your body into more of a relaxed state, plus you're giving your body the nutrients that it needs to help with focus, regulating blood sugar. So I love that combination. All right, great. Thank you everyone for sharing. So here's where we'll be going tonight and the topics we'll be covering. So we'll talk about foods that can trigger anxiety um, versus what foods can actually help reduce anxiety. So what type of nutrients you can eat to help reduce symptoms of anxiety. And we'll also talk about strategies or tools that you can use to actually optimize your nutrition uh, and actually uh, how your nutrition can help reduce uh, anxiety symptoms and also improve your mental health overall. And then at the end, we'll do our monthly experiment, and then we'll wrap it up with a Q&A. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And today I'm joined with Dr. Nishi Bhopal, who is an integrative psychiatrist and sleep specialist at Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. So hi, Nishi. Hi. Hi, Ilar. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm really excited to hear more from Ilar about nutrition and anxiety. Um, so before we jump into the topic, just a quick disclaimer that what we're providing today is information only. It's not medical advice. So if you have specific questions about your own health or um, your own situation, please talk to your healthcare practitioner for more guidance. But we'll be providing some educational um, you know, information and content and maybe some tools to try. And um, you can always use this as a jumping off point to have a conversation with your healthcare practitioners, or you can choose to work with one of our practitioners here one-on-one -on -one to, to go a little bit deeper. Um, so nutrition and anxiety is a really interesting topic because the research is still pretty limited on this, even compared to other mental health conditions, there's more research on nutrition and depression, nutrition and ADHD, which was our topic last month. Um, but nutrition for anxieties, it's still kind of, um, I mean, all of these topics are emer emerging. Um, we do need more research on nutrition and all of these things, but anxiety has a little bit less research. So we're going to be talking about what is sort of known so far. And one of the reasons that there is less information about this is because the studies that have been done have been done in different types of populations. So some of them would look at people without anxiety, but maybe who have stress. Other studies maybe looked at people with certain types of conditions, for example, cancer patients um, who are dealing with anxiety. So there's a lot of heterogeneity, so like a lot of differences in the types of studies. So it's hard to extrapolate um, you know, information from all of these different kinds of studies. Um, but we're going to be talking about just generally the types of foods and the way that we eat and how that can impact anxiety levels, whether someone is dealing with generalized anxiety or other forms of anxiety disorders. Um, because ultimately, food is fuel, right? It's fuel for the brain and fuel for the body. And without, um, a, you know, good quality diet and eating the right way, uh, we're not fueling our, our bodies um, optimally. So let's talk about starting with the types of foods that can trigger anxiety. I know this is one that maybe people don't really think about, but the food that we eat can sometimes trigger anxiety symptoms or stress symptoms. So Ilar, can you share more about what these foods might be and what people should look out for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think first, in order to understand why the food we eat can impact our anxiety levels and our mental health overall, it's really important to understand the gut brain connection and the relationship that they have. So I know we're a little bit limited on time. So I highly recommend checking out our YouTube channel. We have really great videos on there that are more extended and detailed on these specific topics. And we have one that's really great on the gut brain axis. Um, and we can maybe put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat if anyone's interested. So the gut and the brain are directly connected and they're constantly sending signals back and forth. So there's a bi-directional relationship. And a lot of times people notice that the way they eat impacts how they feel and then vice versa, the way they feel, their emotions, their mood can impact their food choices and what they eat. Now, the gut microbiome, it consists of a variety of different bacteria, microbes, fungi. So the microbiome is actually this environment, this community and environment that they have needs to be healthy. Um, they need to grow. They need to thrive. They need to have the right types of foods to eat. And that can come from our diet, but also having a healthy gut can also impact, be impacted by our mental health. So 
people go through periods of chronic stress um, or no, they notice when they're highly anxious, they might even get things like a stomach ache or their bowel habits might change. Um, and this has to do with how our mental health, just like you mentioned, the research with depression is stronger out there now compared to anxiety, but we know that there's definitely a relationship there. Um, and the digestive system and the gut brain access actually doesn't just um, start down here in the you know, stomach, large intestine, small intestine, it actually starts in the mouth. So our digestive tract starts in the mouth. When we eat, we release enzymes. Um, your, your saliva is doing a lot of the digestion um, and having a healthy digestive tract can actually start, you know, from the, when you first eat the food all the way down till you have a bowel movement. So the types of foods that can actually trigger anxiety also can worsen your digestive issues. They can be a bit more harmful for these bacteria or your gut microbiome. Um, for example, a lot of processed and packaged foods. So foods that are highly refined, refined sugars and starches. Um, you'll notice things like enriched flour. So that's a really common ingredient you'll see in certain types of foods. The flour has actually been completely depleted of its nutrients and then the nutrients have been added back in. So that tells us something about how highly refined it is. Refined sugars is also a really common ingredient that you'll see in a lot of different foods. And these foods can be a little bit addicting. So our taste buds, our brain can actually start to depend on them a little bit more for energy. And people notice a cycle. So the more they eat a certain food, the more they tend to crave it. Um, also, uh, a lot of additives and preservatives that are in these foods. So the food dyes, the colorings, um, those can also be really harmful for our mental health. And people notice that when they eat a lot of, you know, quote unquote, junk food, um, they tend to feel a bit more anxious. Um, we actually crave these foods more when we're stressed, which is kind of hard to break this habit because they can be more comforting. We want to eat something sweet. We want to eat something rich in carbohydrates. We don't really feel like having chicken and broccoli when we're really stressed out because we want something that makes us feel good. Um, another thing that can actually worsen anxiety is caffeine. And I know that this can vary for people. So the amount of coffee that you have, some people are a lot more sensitive, um, but typically people notice that when they already feel anxious and they drink more coffee, their anxiety levels definitely go up. Or let's say someone who is experiencing anxiety and they start to cut back on their caffeine a little bit, they do notice an improvement in their anxiety most of the time. And what coffee does is, um, you know, just a little bit of scientific um, information is it actually blocks the adenosine receptor in our brain. Um, and adenosine helps with our sleep, our mood, you know, our energy levels. So when we're actually disrupting these um, adenosine receptor and their function and what they're intended to do, people notice that they might have a hard time falling asleep. Um, they might actually feel more tired in the mornings or as the caffeine wears off, now they have a crash um, or they get super anxious after that second cup of coffee or when they have uh, excessive amounts of coffee first thing in the morning just to get their energy levels back up. Um, so those are just some examples of different types of foods. So highly processed, refined foods, refined sugars, starches, um, uh, foods with a lot of preservatives, additives, and then caffeine as well. Yeah, thank you. That's really, that's really helpful. And I think um, starting, like you said, with the gut microbiome, making sure you have a healthy gut flora, because it's the little bugs in the gut that actually synthesize a lot of our neurotransmitters. Like 90% of our serotonin is in the gut, about 50% of our dopamine is in the gut. So if our gut microbiome isn't healthy and if it's not working properly, our body can't even synthesize those neurotransmitters that are involved in mood, including in anxiety. Um, so there's this interesting study that I'll share that is from, I think it's from 2021. Um, and they looked at 1500 different um, studies. So this is like a meta-analysis of 1500 different studies looking at anxiety and nutrition. And they found that there's basically five categories of food or eating that are associated with more anxiety. And um, this is all along the lines of what you were just sharing, but just to kind of recap. So a high fat, high cholesterol and high trans fat diet, 
And maybe Ilar, in a moment, you can share like what that might mean. Like what are those foods? Um, inadequate tryptophan and dietary protein, which we were talking about before we got started. So um, again, I'd love to hear um, what foods those might be that um, might have inadequate tryptophan. Um, as you mentioned, high intake of sugar, refined carbohydrates, and artificial sweeteners. Um, and that has to do with blood sugar and insulin levels. So we can look at that and what that relationship is with anxiety. And then the last two are um, quote unquote unhealthy dietary patterns. You know, we don't necessarily want to think of things in terms of healthy and unhealthy because that can be a little bit too simplified or too binary or create more anxiety. But um, these are defined as diets that are high in those unhealthy fats and refined sugars. And then the fifth thing was snacking, which I thought was really interesting was associated with more anxiety. Um, so Ilar, could you share a little bit more maybe about some of those foods? So what what might be like high fat, high trans fat foods, um, and then some of those refined carbohydrate foods, like what should we be looking out for? Yeah, definitely. So um, the types of fat, you know, we talk about healthy fats, unhealthy fats, you know, you see labels, trans fat, saturated fat, monosaturated, polyunsaturated. But basically, when you look at fat, a lot of times fat that comes from certain animal products, I would say, especially highly fatty types of meat, like red meat, pork, um, especially if it's from a non-grass fed animal, it's definitely going to contain higher amounts of the unhealthy fats, uh, foods that have been fried or cooked in very high amounts of oils, especially if you're eating out, it's very unlikely that they're using things like avocado oil or extra virgin olive oil to prepare your foods especially fast foods like burgers, fries, those are probably going to be cooked in things like peanut oil, vegetable oils, which are highly in inflammatory and unstable at really high temperatures, which is what kind of environment you need to deeply fry food. Um, and they use high amounts of oils, you know, actually dipping the food all the way in the oil for um, a short period of time so that it cooks faster, but then it makes it a lot more unhealthy. Um, the refined flour starches, you're going to find those and definitely white bread. A lot of times, again, you'll see like enriched white flour. Um, basically, a lot of processed and packaged foods are going to contain a lot of refined sugars and starches unless you see labels like whole grains. You know, it's made with whole um, rolled oats, you know, things like quinoa, uh, steel cut oats. The whole grains are going to be a lot healthier and very less likely refined and processed. Um, and then the refined sugars as well, you can find those in things like sweets, uh, like cereals, a lot of candies, um, dessert foods, ice cream. So it comes down to the ingredients. And I would say um, you're going to want to look for minimal ingredients as much as possible, but also ideally ingredients that you can find yourself in your kitchen or put together this meal yourself. Um and then one really interesting thing you mentioned, you know, in those studies was snacking. So what can happen a lot of times is when people start to depend on a lot on snacking, they're more likely to skip meals. So they're snacking constantly throughout the day. So their blood sugars might be going up and down a lot more versus when you have a substantial meal, you're getting adequate amounts of protein, healthy fats, whole grains, you're very less likely to get hungry in between those meals. Um, your blood sugars are likely going to be more stabilized. Plus the snacking patterns typically tend to be uh, foods that are also more um, refined, uh, processed, more carbs and sugars, especially which keep us full and energized for a shorter period of time. It's less likely that someone is snacking on fruit and nuts all day long, I would say. Um, so the snacking patterns, I would say that's one reason that they can actually uh, increase symptoms of anxiety. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And, and just to kind of um, tie that together with the overall um, dietary patterns. So some of these studies have also found that a Western dietary pattern or the standard American diet, also known as SAD or SAD, right? Because it is a SAD sort of diet. It's There's lots of refined carbohydrates and um, trans fats and processed foods in that diet. These studies are also shown to be um, associated with higher levels of anxiety. Um, and like you mentioned at the beginning, there's a bi-directional relationship because when people are struggling with anxiety or depression, um, 
they may not have the energy or the mental bandwidth to go grocery shopping, to prepare meals, right? You might not feel like eating, a, you know, a side of broccoli, you might want to reach for the mashed potatoes or something that's a little bit more high in carbohydrates or starches, um, or reach for that dessert. So um, maybe we can also talk about if we have time, some strategies to navigate that. I actually saw a patient earlier today who is dealing with severe anxiety and she's lost her appetite and um, she doesn't feel like cooking. And so we, we talked about, well, what can you eat and what can help actually be nutritious um, to support your system, even when you don't feel like eating certain types of foods. So maybe we can look at that if we have time or if people have questions, please feel free to jump in. This is meant to be interactive. So you can raise your hand or, or come on screen and ask your questions too. Um, so let's see. So, oh yes. So if you could explain the link between the low blood sugar, you mentioned how snacking or um, skipping meals can cause a drop in blood sugar. What's the relationship with anxiety? Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, definitely. So when we have low blood sugars or it's what's referred to as hypoglycemia versus hyperglycemia, it's often very noticeable. So people will either feel lightheaded, they might feel dizzy because their blood sugars are super low, but then people might also feel more irritated. Um, you know, they might be more easily agitated, feel more anxious. They might find it really difficult to focus. So these are all things that might show up in symptoms of anxiety for some people. Um, and when you are in a state of hypoglycemia or having very low blood sugar levels, it's also harder to think about what you want to eat. And oftentimes, just like you mentioned, you know, we want those comforting foods. We want the foods that are rich in carbohydrates, like some rice or mashed potatoes or a piece of bread sounds really good in that moment versus, you know, actually having a meal and creating a meal. Um, so thinking about ways to actually prevent this from a preventative approach is really important. And one thing I love about our practice is because we take a whole body approach, um, we don't just tell our patients, you know, you need to eat more protein. This is what you need to do. We actually think about, okay, what does your day look like? Is this realistic? How can we actually use strategies and tools to help you meal prep? Um, what are some barriers uh, to eating healthy or maybe even actually having the appetite to eat, just like you mentioned for um, this one patient. So there's actually a really significant connection between the body you know, the brain and the gut. So we have to really figure out how to strengthen that and allow individuals to actually pay attention to the signals that their gut is sending them, just like how we can detect, oh, I'm really full or, oh, I'm really hung hungry. When we're highly stressed or anxious, we can't really detect or recognize those signals. Um, so actually meal prepping can be really helpful or actually thinking ahead of time. Okay. Do I have protein in my meals? Do I have something that I can put together um, to help with regulating the blood sugars? And protein is one of the most important things that can help prevent episodes of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. So a lot of times we'll hear this for patients who have prediabetes or type two diabetes, and we're really focusing on building their insulin resistance and helping uh, with managing their blood sugars. But this is also really important for any individual especially when it comes to things like anxiety. So when we think about protein, the amount of protein we need can vary between individuals. But typically I say, you know, as a rule of thumb, our body needs about one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight throughout the entire day. Um, and initially this sounds like a lot when I break it down for people, but when you start applying it and you see, wow, I feel really full. I feel so satiated. I feel energized after our meals. It starts to make sense. So let's say an individual weighs 60 gram uh, kilograms. They're going to need about 60 grams of protein for the entire day. And you can divide it up and say, okay, I'm going to have about 15 to 20 grams of protein per meal. Maybe I'll get a little bit of protein with my snacks, um, but that is the goal. And starting with just one meal at a time, because I know sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to get 60 grams of protein in the whole day, every day of the week? So just start with breakfast and say, okay, my goal is to get 15 grams of protein for breakfast five days this week. Especially on the weekdays, a lot of people tend to work. It's hard to plan your meals. You may be more rushed in the mornings. Um, and a little bit of um, 
information about how much protein you can get in different foods, just to put it into perspective. So one egg has about six grams of protein. And if you eat three eggs for breakfast, you're getting about 18 grams of protein. And you, people will notice, okay, when I eat a piece of toast for breakfast with my coffee, initially they're feeling good. They're like, okay, you know, I had something to eat, but then they'll start feeling really anxious, really hungry around lunchtime. Right. And that's because their blood sugars are crashing. The caffeine is wearing off and now their brain is able to detect how hungry they are. um, And they start to feel really, really stressed out and anxious versus if they start the day with three eggs and their coffee, they'll notice that they feel more energized. Um, It can actually help reduce some of the effects that you feel from the coffee wearing off later on in the day. Plus you don't feel as anxious or hungry going into your lunch and it can help you make healthier choices for that next meal. That's really helpful to to get an idea of the amount of protein um, to incorporate so Kirtana um, put that in the chat. So that's great. Um, really helpful. Thank you, Kirtana, for adding that. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So we've talked about the foods that can trigger anxiety. So these, to recap, were the high glycemic index foods, the foods that are high in um, refined sugars, refined carbohydrates, artificial sweeteners as well. We didn't really talk about that, but that's in that category. Um, and then we talked about the inadequate protein. And so Ilar just shared how to get um, or how to make sure you're getting enough protein. So let's let's talk about the foods that we should incorporate. Um, so you mentioned protein. Um, what else? What else should we be adding into our diet or focusing on to help reduce levels of anxiety? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, we talked a, a bit about the foods that trigger anxiety. So I always say it's important to take out what's causing the anxiety as well while you're putting in what can help reduce the anxiety. So if the coffee is worsening your anxiety, cut back on that first. And at the same time, try to put in more nutrients that can reduce anxiety. So the protein is really important because of how it can manage our blood sugars, um, prevent things like hypoglycemia. Also nutrients that can help support our gut microbiome and specifically things like prebiotic rich foods and probiotic rich foods. So probiotics are the good bacteria, the healthy bacteria that we need in our digestive tract to not only properly break down our food, but also be able to synthesize hormones, neurotransmitters that can actually impact our brain, things like serotonin, like you mentioned, that can make us feel happy. Um, It can actually help also reduce symptoms of anxiety. So probiotic rich foods can be uh, fermented foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, Um, yogurt also has a lot of probiotics, Uh, things like tempeh, which is a soy type of protein and also miso, um, which can be found in the Japanese soup. But then also the prebiotic rich foods, which are the fiber foods that the probiotic bacteria feed on. So not only are you putting the good bacteria in your digestive tract, you're giving them the food that they need to grow and thrive. And that's why a lot of times you'll see the supplements in combination, pre and probiotic combination. So the prebiotic foods you can find in things like uh, asparagus, plantains, garlic, onion. Um, So these fiber foods can actually help the good bacteria in your digestive system grow, um, which can help create a healthier environment and help uh, positively impact your mental health. Also things like omega-3 fatty acids. So a lot of times we hear about healthy fats, right? Not all fats are bad. And the brain is also mostly made up of fat. So how can we support our brain function by eating more good fat? Um, And omega-3 fatty acids actually are the healthier fats compared to omega-6. So we want to have a higher omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. And you can find omega-3 fatty acids uh, in things like wild fatty fish, like salmon, uh, sardines, mackerel, uh, also plant-based foods like avocados, uh, extra virgin olive oil, a variety of nuts and seeds like chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, pumpkin seeds. Um, And these can also help reduce overall inflammation, which as we know, a lot of times can be a root cause of a lot of mental health conditions like depression and anxiety. 
Um, also antioxidant rich foods. So one thing that I've been seeing a lot of actually in my clients is high levels of oxidative stress, especially for patients who are struggling with things like anxiety. Um, they're, they're actually under a really high state of oxidative stress. And I think this can have to do with lower levels of antioxidants in their body. So they're not able to properly fight off these free radicals, their oxidative stress levels start to go up. Um, some people can actually require supplementation to really help reduce those levels, but nutrition can also be really helpful. So we take a food first approach um, and antioxidant rich foods. You can find them in a variety of fruits, especially berries like blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, uh, a lot of whole grain products um, like quinoa, uh, steel cut oats, and also a lot of dark green leafy vegetables like kale, spinach, uh, broccoli. Those are also high in antioxidants. Um, and then uh, the next one is herbs and spices. So, you know, things like turmeric, we hear a lot about helps fight inflammation, also has antioxidants, uh, saffron, which we love to use in Middle Eastern cooking, has a really nice aroma and flavor. Um, and certain herbs like chamomile or herbal teas like green tea, these can also have higher levels of antioxidants and they can be a bit more calming like chamomile, especially um, for people uh, experiencing anxiety. Now, the last category are a variety of vitamins and minerals. And I always mention this um, using a diagram that I share with my clients, and it has to do with how our body breaks down uh, macronutrients like carbohydrates, fat, and protein into energy. And when you really see this cycle and how our body goes through it, it starts to make sense why if you don't have enough B6, let's say vitamin B6 helps a lot with our digestive system and breaking down nutrients and actually getting energy from our food. Um, you start to see, okay, that's why, you know, I feel this way. And if you're lacking certain nutrients like the B vitamins, zinc, magnesium, um, you're going to notice a difference in not only how your digestive system is working, but also how you're feeling mentally. Um, and a lot of these nutrients, especially things like magnesium and zinc, you can find in a variety of nuts and seeds and also dark green leafy vegetables. But the supplementation, I would say, is something that you definitely should consider working with a healthcare professional so you can find specifically how much your body needs and whether or not you do need to supplement um, because it can be very individualized, um, how much you need to take, whether or not you need to continue the same dose, go on a maintenance dose, it can get a little bit complicated. So I recommend working with a healthcare professional. Excellent. Wow. So much good information there. And thank you, Kirtana, again, for posting um, the summary in the chat. And so um, if people are on your laptop, you could copy and paste that into a document to save it, or you could take a screenshot if you're on your phone, um, just so you can go back and, and revisit that later. Um, yeah, and just to recap, you mentioned in, um, inflammation being implicated in um, mental health conditions. And so we do see a link between inflammation and conditions like depression, anxiety, um, even ADHD. And um, as you said, the Mediterranean diet is shown to help reduce inflammation. And so that's a great strategy um, for supporting brain health and reducing anxiety as well. And it doesn't have to be the Mediterranean diet. Um, generally, like traditional diets um, are high in whole grains, healthy fats, plants, veg you know, vegetables, fruits, um, nuts and seeds and so forth. So, um, you know, what that means is like, you know, if you're of Indian origin, like I am, you know, focusing on a, on the diet of your you know, country of origin, or if you're even if you're from, you know, Scandinavian countries, um, there's a lot of whole foods, fish, um, if you're, you know, Japanese or Southeast Asian descent, focusing on those foods and, and bringing those into your diet um, is it, really helpful. So it doesn't have to be specifically the Mediterranean style. But the idea is these traditional diets that were um, predominantly plant based, uh, with, with with protein, with a good amount of protein and the whole grains and, and healthy fats. Um, the ketogenic diet is also shown to help reduce anxiety. Um, we have Josh on the call, and then uh, he's our uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner. He's really an expert on the ketogenic diet, along with Ilar, and the two of them work together to support patients um, who want to explore the ketogenic diet for anxiety and depression and um, 
other mental health related symptoms. So that's really interesting data point as well. And one other thing I saw in this study, this is all from that analysis of of the um, 1500 studies, is that eating breakfast was shown to help reduce anxiety levels. So Ilar, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, I was actually thinking about that earlier today. And, you know, it's one of those things that the start of your day, I think can make such a huge difference for what the rest of the day looks like. And it can be so easy to skip breakfast. Um, You know, you maybe don't have enough time. Sometimes people say, I don't really feel hungry first thing in the morning. Um, A lot of times it has to do with the cup of coffee that they choose to have first, which actually suppresses their appetite. So they don't feel hungry after having that caffeine. Um, But when you do have a really, you know, adequate amount of protein, healthy fats first thing in the morning. Imagine how that gives you energy. Imagine how it can help with controlling your blood sugars, um, preventing hypoglycemia later on in the day. Um, Plus, again, we talked about how it can help you make healthier food choices going into the next meal. So that pattern can actually continue on throughout the rest of the day versus If you skip breakfast, let's say you have your cup of coffee and you're like, okay, I'm good. You know, I'm going to skip breakfast, which a lot of people do for, for weight loss, which I also don't really recommend for most people, because then you end up having a larger meal for lunch. You're super hungry going into lunch. uh, And you also tend to make more unhealthy choices. Um, So your blood sugar starts to crash. And then around lunchtime, um, you're probably feeling more anxious, more stressed, you're finding it harder to focus, especially if you're at work, or maybe you're at school, um, you need to pay attention. And then lunchtime comes around some people, you know, they have to go out and get food. So they want to eat something really quickly until they have their meal. Um, You're, you know, you're going to crave carbs, you're going to crave sugars to get the blood sugars up as quickly as possible. So you're going to want potato chips, chocolate, candy, something sweet. So you can imagine how just by skipping that first meal, just by not having breakfast or having a breakfast that let's say is just coffee, it's really going to impact your eating habits, your mood and your anxiety levels just throughout the whole day. That's such a great point. And, and it reminds me of a patient that, that I worked with a number of years ago, and he was dealing with a lot of anxiety during the day and it would get worse in the afternoons. And he had seen a therapist, he had tried medications and it was kind of helping, but not really. And so we went back to um, the basics. We go through the whole lifestyle and we like to understand, you know, what people are doing dr- throughout the day, how they're sleeping, what supplements they're taking. You know, we kind of look at everything. And it turned out he was skipping breakfast and also kind of skipping lunch most days or eating very little, like a little bar or something, and then getting takeout for dinner. Um, And so his blood sugar was low during the day and then it would drop in the afternoons because he was barely eating, um, but he was on the go working. And so he was having hypoglycemia, which was showing up as anxiety, like heart racing, mind racing, um, feeling shaky, jittery, felt like he was having a panic attack but he was actually really hungry and he also had baseline anxiety. So the two things were interacting and he was vegetarian too. So we, we just started implementing a very light breakfast. So just a little bit of nut butter and a banana for breakfast because he wasn't very hungry in the morning. So just something small and then lunchtime, um, something like a black bean patty and then a little bit of a salad with some good olive oil for dressing. Um, And just those simple things, it made a huge difference. And within a few days, he was like, Oh, I feel so much better. I'm not having these anxiety attacks anymore. So for anyone listening, do you think about what you're eating and the the timing of your meals and how that might be impacting your brain function, your ability to focus and also your mood? And so that takes us on to because I'm being mindful of time. We, there's a lot to cover here. So um, we'll just move on to the next topic, which is other strategies to optimize your nutrition. Um, you know, we've talked about the types of foods to incorporate but it's not just about what we're eating, but also how we're eating. Um, So could you share more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, the example that you shared about that patient reminded me of a patient I saw a few months back. And similarly, he was having um, one big meal in the middle of the day. And he said, you know, my stomach aches start around lunchtime. And it was because he was eating that meal really fast. That meal was the largest meal of the day, wasn't really taking the time to sit down and digest that food getting up, moving on to the next activity. Um, So it's not just about what we're eating, but how we're eating, when we're eating, just like you mentioned. And there are 
key tools, you know, strategies, things that we can use to actually help our digestive system slow down. Um, and it starts with, you know, uh, before we actually have the meal. So a lot of times we'll take like 30 minutes to prepare a meal, sometimes several hours, and then we'll just eat it in a matter of minutes. And then we'll just get up and move on to the next activity. Um, so mindful eating is actually a really important practice for our digestive system, for our mental health, for our anxiety levels. And again, this can be um, a bit more of a detailed or extensive topic. And I, we have a, a YouTube video on this as well. So mindful eating and um, techniques and tools that you can use. But essentially your goal is to first be non-judgmental towards yourself. I know it's hard to eat really healthy, apply all these principles every single day, every single meal. Um, so be forgiving with yourself, be non-judgmental about the choices that you're making, but at the same time, try to be a bit more intentional. So it does take a bit of preparation, practice, prioritizing, especially. So one thing that makes a huge difference is actually preparing and planning, right? So if your goal is to eat a healthy breakfast or not skip breakfast, it's going to take some effort and it's going to take a little bit of planning. So if you know you only have 10 minutes in the morning for breakfast, um, just like the example you mentioned, Nishi, having some nut butter with a banana, that's simple. Or, you know, having one or two hard boiled eggs that you can even prepare and leave in the fridge the night before. Um, sometimes I recommend just having a cup of yogurt with some nuts or fresh fruit sprinkled on top. Um, that's going to give you 15 to 20 grams of protein just for that one meal. So strategizing a bit, planning ahead, um, and trying to meal prep, I would say most days of the week. I know it's hard to do it every single day, but if you have a busy schedule, let's say you're at work, um, you don't have much time to leave the desk, get something to eat, um, try to meal prep some of those days and actually incorporate good sources of protein, um, making sure you're getting adequate amounts of healthy fats in those meals. And that can also give you more time to sit down and enjoy that meal. So if you're spending half of your lunch break going out and buying the food, you're probably going to have to eat that food way more quickly to get back to work. Um, so when the meal's already prepared and ready for you, all you have to do is maybe heat it up and then sit down and enjoy it. Um, some tools for mindful eating are, uh, you know, actually sitting down during your meal time. So not standing up and eating quickly, but sitting down, taking a second to actually look at your food, appreciate your food, um, you know, using our senses, smelling it, seeing it, tasting it. Um, some people like to say gratitude or say a prayer that gives you a second to actually slow down and transition your body from the fight or flight mode, which we might be in most of the day. Um, to more of a rest and digest mode. So instead of carrying, um, let's say the anxiety that might be present before that meal into your meal time, you can actually help transition the body into a more calm state before you eat the meal, which can reduce things like heartburn, acid reflux, abdominal pain that might come later on, or even things like bloating and constipation, which can be triggered by higher amounts of stress or anxiety. Um, limiting distractions. So if you're, you know, scrolling on your phone, you're sitting at your desk, you're probably going to be eating at a different pace, maybe not chewing your food as thoroughly. Um, and then your digestive tract is going to have to do a lot more of that work. Um, eating with your non-dominant hand, I always say, you know, if you're out of all options, just swap hands and it's really going to force you to slow down. If you've ever tried like brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand, it feels really weird, but it causes you to go more slowly, pay more attention. Um, and it's going to do the same thing when you're eating that way too. Um, so those are some things I would recommend. Definitely check out our video for more um, tips and tools for mindful eating, but preparing, strategizing, planning ahead, um, and then applying some of these mindful eating techniques around your meal times. Excellent. That's so helpful. And, and we've got the link to the mindful eating video in the chat. And then Kirtana, um, added uh, an easy breakfast recipe. Um, oh, that's great. Overnight chia seed oatmeal. Uh, so thank you, Girthana, for for sharing that. That's that's a great idea. And I think just, you know, just to add on to the mindful eating piece, part of it is slowing down, right? And as you said, we're often in our sympathetic or um, fight, flight, and freeze part of the nervous system during the day. 
um, but to digest food, we need to be in that parasympathetic mode, the rest and digest mode. And so by slowing down how you eat, even just slowing everything down, how you breathe, even how you speak, how you move, how you walk through the day, it tells your nervous system that you're safe. And that can help to reduce stress and anxiety because anxiety is essentially a state that we go into and we feel unsafe when our nervous system feels like there's some kind of threat. So slowing down can really help. And what we eat is not just about the food that we're putting into our mouth, but also how we digest the food, how we absorb it, how we assimilate it into the body, you know, how it's converted to neurotransmitters and all these other um, things that we've been talking about. And so even if you're eating enough food or, or you know, a, a wide variety of, of these foods that we've been talking about, if you're not digesting it properly or if you're not absorbing it, um, it's, it's not going to be as effective, right? So these are tools you can use to help improve your digestion. As far as timing, I know people often ask me because I specialize in sleep, people ask me how late is it okay to eat? I Laura, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. I usually recommend to finish your dinner three hours before bedtime. But then if you're still hungry, especially if you're waking up with uh, anxiety, panic attacks at night, or low blood sugar episodes at night, to have a high fiber, high protein snack about an hour before bed. Uh, but what are your thoughts about timing? Yeah, definitely. And I completely agree. Um, you know, I say three hours, ideally, um, if it's two hours, that's okay too, but try to aim for the three hours. Some people say, you know, I finish work late, I do this and that. So aiming for the three hours, most days of the week, again, whatever you do most of the time is going to make the most impact. Um, and if you notice that you always get hungry before bed, I recommend reassessing what are you having for dinner? Are you getting enough protein, enough fiber in that meal? Um, and if you're constantly feeling hungry right before bed, definitely having that snack about an hour before rather than waiting until right before bedtime when you're laying there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. Uh, you know, I can't wait till breakfast. So we definitely want to avoid that as well because that can trigger anxiety, can make it harder to sleep. And we've talked about, you know, sleep is the foundation of our health. And we've done an earlier episode on this as well. So having a snack, um, ideally, like you mentioned, with some protein, with some fiber, like having some nuts, um, certain types of fruits can be uh, better for sleep, like cherries, kiwis, things like that. Um, so having those snacks available to you so that you're not anxious thinking about oh, I'm going to get hungry right before bed, but it can be a bit more comforting thinking, I can eat this, I'm not going to be hungry, and I can still get a good night's sleep. Um, again, and it involves a little bit more planning and strategizing and listening to your body and noticing those patterns. Right. And we have, we did a previous workshop on nutrition and sleep. And so that's up on our YouTube channel. So if anyone's interested in looking at that, you can find that on YouTube. Um, so I'm just checking the time. So maybe we can wrap up there because I want to make sure we have time for questions. So Ilar, if people want to work with you, if they want to take a deeper dive, um, how can people find out more? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you can definitely find us on social media. Um, we're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We put a lot of updates on there about upcoming workshops or, um, you know, what's new with our practice. Um, definitely check out our website um, and we can put a link in the chat as well. So you can learn more about the services we offer, our providers, and basically what we do at our practice and what makes us so unique. Um, you can look into scheduling a free discovery call um, and you can learn if we're a good fit for you and what kind of things you're looking for. Um, definitely recommend attending our free monthly nutrition workshops. So you can sign up for those um, through our website or through the emails that we send um, each month. And we try to do a new topic every month. Um, and then lastly, the YouTube channel, I think that's a really great way to catch a lot of important topics where we go into more detail and we have more extensive discussions and you can replay them, you can take notes, um, and you can reach out to us via email if you have any questions or if you have recommendations for future workshops. Um, so I would say definitely check out the website and then our social media platforms. Great. Right. Yes. So if anyone has suggestions for topics you'd like to learn more about relating to nutrition and mental health, please put those in the chat. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear your recommendations. Um, so we can open it up to questions. I know, Ilar, did you have any more slides to show or? Yeah, was... so I can share just the, the last bit. Um, 
of information that I have here because, um, you know, just as a wrap up while we're waiting for everyone to put their uh, questions in the chat and you can definitely do so now. Uh, Okay. Um, so once a month, we, you know, do a monthly experiment at the end of the workshop. And this is just something that you can take away. And it really is just an experiment. And it's okay if it doesn't go well. Um, you know, I say, it, there's never anything that you're failing at. It's always a learning experience. So just try something new. And I know it can be challenging, but pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, if you don't really feel like having breakfast, try having something small, like we talked about, see how it goes and be curious, pay attention to how it's impacting your energy levels, your mental health, your hunger, your mood throughout the day. So here are just some examples, you know, maybe your goal is to eat more healthy fats, more protein. Um, starting with one meal at a time. Maybe your goal is to avoid skipping meals or a specific meal. Maybe your goal is to avoid skipping breakfast. Um, and then definitely come back next month. So we encourage you to come back and share how your ex uh, experiment went. And you can write it down on your worksheet just to be reminded of it. And I recommend sharing it with people. That can be fun. Um, it can be a way to hold yourself accountable. And you can also learn about... Um, you know, share uh, what you're learning, but also learn about how it's impacting your body. Um, so Annabelle said, um, I think I will avoid skipping breakfast. Yeah. And I think that's a really great goal, Annabelle. So um, coming up with some ideas, things that you like to eat in the mornings, um, maybe, uh, you know, things with protein, healthy fats, just like we talked about, and then seeing how it affects you and how it affects your mental health. All right, great. Um, one thing I'll definitely be trying to do is meal prepping a little bit more. It's something I've been working on and I've noticed that it can also help you avoid skipping meals. So if you don't have a meal prepped, it's much easier to skip meals or resort to snacking, which we also talked about can um, sometimes worsen anxiety for some people. So if you do have the opportunity to meal prep for some of those meals, maybe meal prepping for breakfast, sometimes it can make it less likely that you'll skip that meal. All right. Um, Nishi, I'm going to uh, try adding more flax seeds to my meals. Yeah. And I love that because we talked about how nuts and seeds fit into so many of these different categories. They can add more antioxidants. They can add more things like magnesium, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids. So they can really help improve our mental health, reducing anxiety and also inflammation. Um, and flax seeds are, you know, they can really go in so many different types of foods like smoothies, oatmeal, um, sprinkling them on salads even. Uh, Kirthana, I'm going to start being more mindful while eating. So many times I catch myself multitasking while eating and going to avoid that uh, going forward. Yeah. And I know that can also be really common. So, um, you know, just sitting, looking at your food, um, sometimes having conversations with people, uh, you know, and appreciating your food while you're eating it and just having that experience with it. And seeing how it affects your digestion after that meal. Um, did you eat slower? Did you chew your food more frequently? And then afterwards, how did you feel? Did you feel less stressed, less anxious? Um, sometimes people notice they actually stay full for a longer time um, because the, the action of actually chewing, it sends different signals to the brain versus if you drink a smoothie, your brain doesn't really associate that as a complete meal. It's more of a beverage, even if you're getting the same amount of calories, protein, nutrients, and everything. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone for sharing. So if you have more um, ideas for your monthly experiment, please write them in the chat. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, so we talked about foods that trigger anxiety, and we also talked about nutrients and foods that can actually help reduce anxiety. Uh, and then we also talked about strategies for optimizing your nutrition. We talked about tools, mindful eating techniques, um, so that it's not only what you're eating, but also how you're eating your meals that can help with reducing anxiety. Um, and then we talked about our monthly experiment, something you can take away, try at home, and then uh, let us know how it went next month. 
All right. If you have any more questions, please write them in the chat. And if you have recommendations for future topics, please let us know. Um, you can check out our website at pacificintegrativepsych.com, which is down here, or we have it earlier up in the chat. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much again, everyone, for attending tonight. Um, I know we went a little bit over time, but check out our YouTube channel if you want more information. Um, sign up for our next workshop, which is going to be next month. Um, and we hope to see you all there.